main blueprints that make the world run has stopped or slowed down. So this has manifested in the ecosystems with the clear water, uh, the blue skies. And for those delegates who are joining with us, it, the interesting thing is in Sri Lanka, we saw recently a beautiful elephant family with its babies were actually having their own field trip on one of the train stations, right? So uh, everything has changed into something that is new to us. So human interaction was suppressed. That is the main outcome of the virus. This has, is what has led us to the, um, the environment to manifest and operate on its, own, on its own terms. And because of that, it is peacefully carrying on its processes, which is a beautiful thing that we've seen, although we are caged. So this is that time we need to understand that um, we cannot waste a good crisis. This is wise words given by Dr. Thago, who has told that we can't waste a good crisis. This is a time that we need to see the big picture and to see the gravity of the actions we make as the modern man. So if we talk about the coronavirus, the media and so many other platforms, they flood us with the information about how it has caused casualties, deaths and distress to a lot of people out there. It is truly sad to see that. Um, but at the same time, it's important to know that this is how it's protecting natural ecosystems. And in fact, there's research to prove that coronavirus is actually saving more lives than it is killing. So if we take, for instance, um, in China, uh, what we've seen is uh, so many scientists who are experts in natural systems. They have sampled the air quality in China, which has improved due to quarantine. Uh, they have taken it and they have taken emission data to see how important how much the air quality has improved. And guys, we know that air pollution is a global cause for premature deaths in the world. In fact, this air quality improvement has saved the lives of 77,000 people in the central China. So that actually is more than the lives that were saved were more by the estimates from the lives that were killed. So what we can see is, the coronavirus destroying or disrupting the lifestyle is one side of the story. There's so many ways that this uh, virus is actually protecting the systems. This is a time for us to really reevaluate our decisions because human activity suppression is what's causing the natural systems to you know, go on its own. And there's more on the way, given that if we continue to make hasty decisions for ecocentric goals, um, there's something that, some things that could happen even worse. For instance, you know, there are ice uh, caps and glaciers in uh, Antarctica that is currently melting due to the greenhouse emissions and the heat that is trapped due to the gases we put into the atmosphere due to the increasing carbon dioxide. So these um, icebergs have millions of viruses in it that has been there for the past million years that is still unknown to modern science. So if this melts and enters the ocean, we are going to have to kind of face something worse than the corona epidemic. So coronavirus is temporarily in the spotlight to diverge, to actually converge our attention into something bigger, something that is actually something we need to sustain and that is the gravity of our actions. So I want to take this moment to quickly say that the moment we separate ourselves from nature is when the problems begin. We are not doing a transaction with nature. Nature is not an external factor. We are nature. Mm. If we deny that we are not nature, it is like a wave that is arising from the ocean is saying, I'm not made of the ocean, which is completely bizarre. So we are all arising from a pool of matter and energy, which is magnificent. We are a part of this beautiful cycle of matter and energy. And the moment we separate ourselves, the moment we fracture ourselves because of the ecocentric, egoistic, power hungry goals, that's when the real problems begin. So I would like to tell everyone to think into the future, think into sustainability, think about going far than going high, and think about the important lessons that coronavirus has taught us. Like I said, we cannot really waste a good crisis. It's important for us to create a platform, to share the knowledge, and talk about things that the media doesn't tell us. The media is always telling us about the death toll, the destruction, the global recession and all that. And, but there's more to the story if we think in terms of a big picture. So I invite everyone to really take a moment to 
evaluate our decisions. And once we are given the opportunity to restructure ourselves, to revive and survive and thrive, make sure you think twice about the decisions you make and have a positive impact, a ripple effect on the rest of us. So that is my few words for you on the opening statement. And hopefully we can consider this as something that we can take far. Thank you very much, Hiroshi, for those beautiful words. And um, surely we have so much to learn from this pandemic. And the, what's really important is learning and then understanding and discovering who really we want to be and also what kind of an impact we can also make. So once again, thanks a lot, Hiroshi, for those words. And next, we have Natasha Ratnayaka. Uh, who is ready to talk about the miracles happened through the pandemic. So recently we got to hear some news about the Himalaya range being visible from some parts of India after 30 whole years, which was quite an eye-opening miraculous point for all of us. So likewise, the environment has performed some miraculous wonders during this pandemic. It would be great, um, Natasha, if you could uh, go through a few wonders performed in the environment. Thank you, Bernie, for uh, into introducing me and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, it's amazing what little we need as a species to survive on this beautiful planet we call home. And uh, what we thought was so important is not important anymore, not even close. Uh, it's taught us to go back to basics. It's taught us to go back to our roots. Uh, that's where we should ideally go uh, and embrace a more simplistic and uh, a more min minimalistic approach to life. And I consider that the high life. Uh, and if you really look at it, uh, meditation, yoga, uh, you know, self-reflection, awareness, uh, just the holistic life has taken center stage. Back in the day now, it was considered uh, a hippie movement. But if you really look uh, world over, it is becoming a normal practice and uh, people are waking up to the truth. Uh, there is much to gain from this way of life and it, remains, uh, it, it, it reminds us of uh, some profound ways of observing and, uh, and uh, living our lives. Uh, call it philosophical or whatever you like to call it. But when we come into this world, uh, we come with nothing. But in this short spell of time on this earth, uh, we have been programmed to hold on to stuff, lots and lots of stuff that does absolutely nothing to our evolution or uh, even our growth. Um, and these present moments have um, taught uh, taught us hard lessons to look inwardly, uh, which we wouldn't have learned any other way. Uh, the human spirit uh, and mind is a beautiful thing, amazing thing. Uh, we start seeing things from a different perspective when we are compelled to. There is much, uh, you know, to learn. And this is a perfect example of that. Um, uh, we most times uh, base our validity as human beings uh, on achievement or become focused on, uh, you know, uh, basically achievements and uh, our lifestyles and, uh, you know, standard of living. But as individuals, we're constantly looking for validity. We are constantly looking to be accepted by society. And uh, as if that was the benchmark of success. In my opinion, it isn't. And these times have kind of awakened us to see the bigger picture, the larger picture. And it has taught me and it has taught all of us uh, more than ever the importance of uh, value of um, human connection, which uh, most of us take for granted. Uh, like for example, um, working parents who uh, are constantly complaining about not having time with their kids, uh, having to 
you know, work during the wee hours in the morning till in the evening and not being able to kind of connect with their kids are forced to do that at, at, at the present moment. And uh, children being forced to be nothing but children right now. Because if you really look at the world over, uh, we are uh, a society that drives um, children to constantly keep achieving and not be their true essence and true uh, authenticity. But all that has changed. I mean, you know, and right now children are being themselves. Uh, you know, children are just playing and connecting with their loved ones. We are constantly pushing our ideals on, on society like there was no tomorrow, like there was this one box to fit, you know. And coming back to uh, this whole situation, my husband, who has been a smoker all his life, have uh, struggled to give it up. You know, uh, he's tried many times to give it up, but, um, but have failed. But this lockdown combined with the curfew have, uh, has given him the, the choice, you know, of focusing on himself and just putting a stop to it. And, uh, and the other thing is like, we all know that uh, the coronavirus is um, respiratory and uh, lung, uh, it, it affects the lungs. But until we are pushed to do something, we, we don't do it. And it's been one and a half months since he had stopped. And I mean, I consider that a blessing in disguise. And it, most of my um, friends in the industry, uh, musicians, have been alcoholics and this, this time has been perfect for them to give it up and, uh, and they have actually. And uh, coming back to the environment, if you really take uh, um, countries like China, US, India, Russia, Japan, uh, Denmark, um, Bangladesh, are some of the main contributors to the environment for pollution uh, when, you, when you take the industrial plants. Right? And pollution from the industrial plants are what's, uh, you know, uh, what's globally uh, affecting us in a ca catastrophic way, right? And if you really look at the educational system, I mean, when I was in school, uh, we are taught about the climate uh, disasters, the climatic changes, uh, why it, uh, how it happens, and a little bit of why it happens. But no one really talks about, you know, why exactly it happens because we are the main contributors to this, this disaster. And so at a very young age, we are uh, desensitized to ignoring the elephant in the room uh, and, and go about business as usual, you know? And in order for us to change, we have to, uh, we have to come together as a collective and we have to, uh, you know, uh, even the young generations included, we have to pressure our governments to, you know, have a more environmental uh, change, you know, and uh, Sri Lanka, we as a tropical country can easily go green because we are blessed with uh, constant sunlight, but, we don't, we, we haven't really gone green. And, you know, if you really look at uh, the solar power uh, business, it's a huge business. And most, most of the meager earning salary uh, people uh, are not able to, uh, you know, afford these things. So I feel that uh, we should take advantage and completely eradicate and get rid of fossil fuels. But where is the money in that, right? That's the question. But what I'm asking all of us is, is this just a webinar that we discuss this and you know, go our separate ways? Or uh, are we going to get our hands dirty and ask the bigger questions and uh, you know, um, just press our governments to change? Because we do have the power within all of us as human beings, maybe not myself alone, but if we 
work as a collective, I think there's so much to gain. And, um, in, and also in times of uh, these, you realize uh, who are more important as, as workers. If you really look at it, the blue collar workers are more valued and um, than the white collar workers. And I have to actually, uh, you know, be appreciative of uh, my domestic help who comes once a week to clean my house. And it's been one and a half months that I have done it myself and I know how difficult it is. And these people just come into our lives. We don't even, um, we just treat them as workers, but, and they're exploited. Most of the time they're exploited and they're not really getting paid uh, adequately. Um, if you take the market vendors, uh, the caretakers, medical nurse staff, uh, emergency services, farmers, grocery, uh, you know, cashiers and the staff in the supermarket, um, truck drivers, uh, delivery people, cleaners, garbage collectors, um, security guards, all of them are heroes in, in, in situations like this. And I think we need to uh, look at the bigger picture and kind of appreciate these people. Uh, and before I conclude, I just want to say that I'm a firm believer of uh, epigenesis and the quantum field and that our energy is our currency and that uh, we are products of our environment and what we send out is what we receive. Uh, so we, we need to understand that just like um, uh, Hiroshi said, we are not one. I mean, we are, we are connected to each other. You know, we are part of each other. So if we don't come together and, you know, do the little work that we need to do, you know, the, this earth is never gonna change. And uh, before I conclude, I just wanna say that uh, we are not our labels and we are not our designations. We have, uh, we have to remember that uh, we are all connected energetically. So I think it's important for us to uh, educate each other and now education is just not going to school like literally going to school it's it's about uh, you know connecting connecting uh, education is literally at a f at your fingertips you know and uh, if you're keen to learn something it's always going to be there and so I want to conclude by saying that we as a human race need to uh, you know, encourage each other and love each other for who we are. Uh, I, may, I may be uh, uh, certain things, but that, that does any different. Uh, so we have to forget about our titles and our labels and uh, the whole, you know, uh, the backgrounds, basically our ethnicities, our creed, our, color, whatever, you know, we all, we are all one, we are all in this together. So um, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Natasha. And it's really nice to see how you spoke from your heart. So thank you very much once again. And now we're ready to move on to scope three. Now scope three is about youth contribution towards sustaining the freshly built environment through the pandemic. And this question goes to Gayatri Kodikwaku. Uh, so finally, the environment has revived from all the severe damages caused to uh, over the previous decades and the polluters are locked down at their own homes due to curfew. Yeah. But the issue is once the situation gets stabilized and the curfew gets lifted, uh, the shutdown factories will reopen. The quietened traffic will come back striking up the pollution levels once again. So, um, Gatri, I would like you to explain in order to sustain this environmental recovery, even after the curfew removal, uh, what sort of uh, steps should the youth take and how can their routine behaviors change? Okay, so before I start the conversation, I first want to open the conversation with gratitude. This is the first time I'm um, a part of an all-female panel, which I think is quite empowering and honestly after hearing Hiroshi and Natasha speak um, it just really opened up my heart to see how uh, how how much we are on the same um, you know uh, 
thinking pattern. Like we, we all think the same. Um, and and it's, it's so eye-opening to be connected to such women. You guys are amazing. I need to appreciate you all first and foremost. Um, so before I speak about certain actions and certain things that we can do in order to rebuild the planet and protect the uh, planet, I want to touch base um, on the reason as to why this destruction has been a part of our reality for so long, why we have mistreated this planet, why we have taken so much but not given back, why we really abused the planet that we live in. And I feel like it's a lack of sensitivity. Um, a lot of us lack compassion, empathy, and sensitivity because we are disconnected. We are disconnected to ourselves, and in return, we are disconnected to each other and the environment. And um, what Hiroshi and Natasha spoke about, the fact that we are one. Um, I think one of the greatest human errors is thinking that we are separate. Um, and we, we, do not, we do not understand that we are part of the ecosystem. We are nature and we, are, we don't own the planet. We are here on rent. These flesh suits that we live in is on rent. You know, we one day have to give it back. <clears throat> so we need to respect and we need to work from a heart space and a heart center um, and work with compassion and empathy. And um, the reason why we are so insensitive and the reason why we are so, so disconnected is because we haven't prioritized inner well-being and spiritual evolution. And we've been so obsessed about, like Natasha said, um, achievements, uh, you know, um, <laughs> collecting a lot of stuff, making a lot of money, recognition, validation, being significant. Um, uh, so all of those things have taken center stage and everything else is, you know, in the background. Um, I watched this amazing documentary about the happiest nations um, on the planet and Tibet was one of them. This was a couple of years ago, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and when they asked them as to, I mean, you guys are a poor country, why are you so happy? Um, to which they replied when the Western man was um, exploring outer space, we were busy exploring our inner space. And I think that that is just amazing. You know, the fact that they had prioritized their inner well-being. So the fact that we are so disconnected comes from that you know, uh, lack of prioritization. Um, so I had this incredible opportunity to um, be a part of this um, plant medicine retreat at the start of the year. So um, in this retreat, they use certain Amazonian plants, which are, which are only found in the depths of the Amazonian forests like Ayahuasca and San Pedro. Um, so they use these plants to um, um, tap into deep levels of meditation. So during this three day, four day retreat, um, I came out a changed person and I realized, and I really got to see how ignorant I've been, you know, about everything. Like I've been so self obsessed about achievements, about creating this legacy. And um, I, I had really forgotten to respect my environment. And one day, the cool thing about you know being a public uh, personality on social media is that people can also criticize you, which I think is great. Um, I think it humbles you. So one day I got this message from a person saying, um, "I see, I saw your grocery haul on Instagram, but you use so much plastic." <laughs> and then, um, and I was like, "Damn straight, this is true. I use so much plastic." So I started recycling. Um, and coming out of that retreat, um, I came out super overwhelmed. Um, I was super overwhelmed with sadness because I realized how cruel I've been to the planet and the environment. And, you know, the earth is our mother. She's been providing for us. She feeds us, she gives us shelter. And what do we give in return? So I came out super overwhelmed and super sad. Um, and when I came out of it, certain habits I really wanted to change, you know, forever for myself. Um, I would talk about meditation for years and years, but meditation would be a practice that I do maybe once a week, twice a week. So when I came out of this retreat, which completely like uh, made me think differently, meditation became a, a daily, um, you know, part of my daily routine um, and prayer, meditation, journaling. So those things. And what happens when you change from within your outer reality response to it? and everyone around you gets affected. The entire world gets affected. It's like the ripple effect. You Just like um, Hiroshi spoke about the wave in the ocean. When you change, everyone else changes. Like Michael Jackson said, you know, you have to start with you. You have to start with the man in the mirror, you know? So that spiritual evolution is everything. 
um, before we even focus on the outer actions, we need to focus on that because that will entirely change you as a person and it'll change the way you perceive, it'll change the way you behave, it'll change the way you um, um, treat people, treat animals, treat the sentient beings on the planet, treat trees, you know, treat nature, it just changes everything. So um, that is something that I would invite everyone to just experiment with. I know Nat Natasha is, you know, really connected with, uh, you know, meditation and, you know, that, that type of spiritual practices. And it really, you can, you can see when she speaks, <laughs> you know, she speaks from a space of uh, such Zen and calm, you know. So that is something that I would really invite our participants to like incorporate into their lives, you know, some form of spiritual practice. So that is one. Um, secondly, educate yourself about the planet. Like this is where we live. Um, there are two documentaries that I would love for you to watch. One is called um, A Strange Rock. Um, it's on Netflix. Um, uh, um, Will Smith's in it. So have you watched it, Hiroshi? Have you watched it? Yeah. One Strange okay. Rock. It's amazing. Okay. Yeah. It's amazing. So, um, and there's another documentary called uh, Night on Earth. So both, I, I remember the first time I, uh, I watched One Strange uh, Rock, I cried. Because I was like, it's incredible how everything is so interconnected. It's effortless, it's magical. And I cried. <laughs> so two of those documentaries, A Night on Earth, A Strange Rock, please watch it. You owe it to yourself. This is the planet. This is, this is our home. You know, let's educate ourselves more about our home. So now moving on to certain things that we can do to protect and rebuild. Um, one thing, of course, recycle, reduce, reuse, um, you know, um, in Sri, I mean, I didn't even know that Sri Lanka had the facility to recycle. That's how ignorant I was uh, at the start of the year. So after someone called me out, I really had to look into it. And I was like, okay. So when I started recycling, I realized it's, it was crazy that most of the stuff that we use aren't even recyclable. And, and that really um, gives you the awareness to be more responsible of your consumption. And then I wanted to look into uh, certain marketplaces that really um, support uh, zero waste uh, products. And in Sri Lanka, from what I have found out, there's only one place called Just Goodness, like a marketplace in Colombo. And I'm sure, um, I mean, from wherever you live, if, if you're slightly more responsible of your consumption, you can actually like do less harm. Um, and thirdly, um, is shop stop. So this idea of Okay, so let, let me give you my personal background. I've been broke for so many years before I started making money. Um, I struggled financially for so long before I started um, creating some form of success in my field for myself. So when I started making money, I went crazy with the shopping. <laughs> so I would just go buy everything and anything just to feel good. Like, wow, you know, it's, it's almost as if I was trying to make up for the lost time. So, um, and when uh, um, I heard about this idea of shop stop, when you go and buy something, ask yourself, are you buying it because it's pretty and colorful and you probably won't need it in 10 days? Or are you buying it because you actually need it? So right now I'm quite responsible of my buying. I ask myself 10 times. I ask my partner 10 times because he's a crazy shopper. <laughs> so um, just ask yourself, do I really need it? And when you ask yourself that question, it'll blow your mind as to how much of crap we buy that we don't even use and that we don't even need. So that's one. And fourth is, might not be the most popular suggestion, is cutting down on meat consumption. So I was vegan and vegetarian for seven years, but it kind of didn't work for my body type and my health. And um, my path to becoming an athlete, it didn't really support me that much. So I went back to eating meat. But then again, learning, learning about the environment and how, um, you know, mass um, meat production and raising animals can really destroy the planet, I started looking for better alternatives. So I went towards wild caught fish and eggs and stuff like that to replace my protein intake. You don't have to go full on vegan, there are other alternatives for you, but it's something that you can think about, you know? So that's one. Um, and the last one I want to speak about, this is something that I've been super passionate about and thank God for the quarantine because we are stuck at home. I see a lot of people planting their own or growing their own food. I mean, it's all over social media on stories. Um, and, and it's incredible. Like this is what we should be doing on a daily basis. And I really looked into it. I've been looking into it for many years, but I didn't have the time to do it. But now here I am, I just ordered 10 uh, biodegradable pots <laughs> and I'm about to you know, uh, um, grow my own food. But one thing I really want you to look into if you have the time is look into this idea of food forests or it's called uh, forest gardening. So it's basically creating a forest-like 
um, system where it's super, um, where there's a lot of biodiversity and it's extremely low maintenance. It's like a jungle full of vegetables and fruit. And you literally don't have to maintain it at all. It's like, it's, it, it's just, you have to let nature do its thing. And it's extremely popular in so many different countries. I've been looking into it for the past few weeks. And luckily uh, in the next few weeks, I'll be getting into a, an initi initiative involving this as well. I'll share it on my social media, but uh, look into food forests and forest gardening. I know not everyone has the land to, uh, you know, garden or, or grow their own food. But um, the positive fact of this um, concept is when you are growing your own food, you have control over what you put into the soil. So you, you, you have the responsibility to either give life to your land or take from your land. So this is where organic farming and growing your own food plays a massive role. So look into it when you have time and that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. There's so much of things for me to do as well right now. I was just, just uh, jotting down certain things, actually. So thank you very much, Gayatri. Thank you very much. And I believe that all our viewers uh, will uh, take something from uh, all the panelists. And not only that, the most important thing that I believe is that um, investing time to listen to us is amazing. But what really needs to be done is that what you learn from today or whenever you learn, you need to start implementing it. Because um, we always think when we learn something, we need to do this, I need to change, I need to somehow work on it. But actually what really happens is uh, after one day or two, then we keep on postponing that, right? That's what most of us, we humans do. But I believe that uh, this quarantine period will definitely transform you to be a better personality. So thank you very much, uh, Gayatri. And I'm sure all of you will start working on those as well. So next scope is uh, conformity of legislature with regards to future environmental aspects. And we have Nethmini Madhavala. So uh, the other critical point is that the youth support alone isn't enough to sustain the environmental recovery achieved and to keep the pollution rates down. The government plays a leading role with regard to this environmental aspect as well. So uh, we would like to know some into depth details about what sort of legislations regarding environmental uh, preservation have been enacted by the government already. And uh, Nidmini, um, are there actually like uh, are those enough? And also, um, as per your view, what sort of new enactments should be added to the constitution with regard to this? Um, thank you, Bernie. Um, it's quite difficult to speak after a very interesting three speeches and to keep it entertaining and engaging. So I'll try because I will be focusing on a lot of uh, jargon. So try to uh, really listen. I know it's going to be not as interesting, but we'll try and keep it interesting. Um, I will give a bit of a background. So after listening to Hiroshi, Natasha, and Gaia, um, it's uh, the concept is now we are in a consumeristic society and it's very materialistic, right? So this is why that we are in this situation as to we have to constantly talk about environment and environment protection. I think it's important to look at when this started, I mean, the wave of talking about environmental protection that came about post 1960s after the world war when all countries started looking at development and then they wanted to focus on how we can develop a country by focusing on the environment. Um, since the Industrial Revolution, uh, the impact on the environment had been really bad. So after this uh, World War also, people started really talking about it. I think a landmark um, convention was the Stockholm Declaration in 1972, where people actually got together and decided, look here, we need development. We need to protect the environment. How best to do it? Right, So this is a declaration that the whole world came together. Uh, since then, the world has been agreeing on so many different things from conventions, uh, treaties, agreements, and we have had so many summits, right? Um, they, are, they are either bilateral agreements or you agree regionally or you agree globally, things like that. Now, what happens is when you agree to something like that, Sri Lanka is a part of the whole global picture, right? So when we as a country go and agree to something internationally, uh, our legal system is such we have to come back home and uh, enact legislation 
so that we can incorporate what we agreed internationally to our domestic legislation. So that is our system. Um, Sri Lanka is currently a party to 40 odd these international multilateral conventions, uh, ranging from sea, air, land, water, um, wildlife, and up to the ozone level, ozone layer also. So what Sri Lanka did in 1980 is that there's this uh, key piece of legislation, if I may, that is known as the National Environmental Act. Right? Under this act, we established a central body called Central Environmental Authority, which has the power to look into what's happening in the environmental sphere in Sri Lanka. They can issue guidelines, rules, regulations, things like that. So they, they basically, as the name says, they're the central body. Um, now, since we have international participants joining in, I think it will be interesting to look at how your country functions. What are the stuff that your government has agreed to and how the law applies in your country? So then only you'll uh, really get the grasp of it. And after this, uh, I said we have like 40 odd uh, conventions that we have agreed to. Um, over a period of time, we have so many laws and acts and bodies that we have on different aspects of the environment. Now, the familiar ones would be the Mahavil Authority, Coast Conservation Authority, Forest Department, the Wildlife Department, things like that. So we have so many several things that are actually looking at different components of the environment. So that is like the legal side of it. And I think we have to focus on what our constitution says. A constitution of a country is the supreme legal body which decides what laws are there, how the country is governed and what are basic principles sort of thing. So um, there are around over 120, 30 countries which has an explicit provision to recognize the right to environment, to say that a person in living in that country has a specific right to live in a safe environment. So the first country to do so is Switzerland in 1971. After that, countries like Greece, Portugal, Spain, immediately added those provisions into their constitution. But um, interestingly, uh, around 40 odd countries have nothing on environment in their constitution. Uh, su surprisingly or not really, uh, Sri Lanka is also a country that has nothing on environment in their constitution. What we have in the constitution is a directive to the government to look into the environmental aspects when they are creating policy. It's like a uh, it's legal jargon, I really don't want to go in, but just to, uh, to say, look here, it's better if you'll take a look at environment also, sort of a thing. Um, so India, interestingly, uh, doesn't have anything on environment in their constitution. What they do, their courts, very interestingly, they use, they have a right to life in their constitution. So what their courts do is that they interpret right to life to include right to environment just to say people have right to drinking water, right to um, good air, or right to be free from noise pollution, things like that. So that's something India is doing because they have a very active judiciary. And Sri Lanka also has a similar approach where um, we have a provision of right to equality in our constitution. People need to be treated equally, sort of. What our courts did was try to expand right to equality so we can include right to environment in it. So if you are really interested, I because we are short for time, if you are really interested, there are cases like the golf face green case, the water sedge case. They're very, there's a political element to it also, but the governments, uh, the courts really tried and um, uh, expanded the scope of uh, equality to include environment into it. Now, all that being said, what is wrong with Sri Lanka and the legal system? <laughs> That's, I think, is the important part. Um, because there, we have laws. We really can't say we don't have enough. Uh, we have laws. But I think what we are lacking is the environment. Um, the, the, the implementation is what we are lacking, basically. Because we have so many laws, so many authorities. But when it comes to implementation, we really don't see it. This is basically, I mean, it's pretty common in the Latin American and the Asian countries where the development is taking a front seat. 
So everyone is worried about how to develop the country and how to achieve those um, indicators um, to say we are a developed country or we reach this level of uh, income. Uh, in that case, and also pe people are quite unaware of what's really happening. For me also, uh, if because we have very busy lifestyle and we are not professional environmentalists, uh, we, it's very rarely that we follow all the trends that are happening in Sri Lanka. So if you noticed um, the social media today, um, there's the beach nourishment project that is happening in the Mount Lavinia Strait and the, the Mount Lavinia Beach Strait and the Calido Beach Strait. So the government is investing 800 million on it. What you basically do is uh, take, create artificial sand barriers to uh, prevent the coastal soil er erosion. What we fail to see is just, if you see the pictures, I think Uttar has shared it. Uh, if you see the pictures, they just uh, dump sand and to make sure that you, the soil doesn't get eroded. Um, but I don't think the coastal conservation is doing it, whether they have actually done the environmental impact of things like that. But since we are not aware, we can't really talk about it because lack of knowledge and awareness. And um, so those things, and I think I'll come, I, I'm sorry, I speak very fast, um, but uh, I'll come back to what we can do. Firstly is engagement. Engagement in the sense regardless of how old you are, uh, don't wait for someone else to come and save the planet for you. It's not going to happen because someone else is you, right? You can, it's really, uh, you can take collective action if you're not very sure how you can take individual steps where you can join NGOs, civil society organizations, or youth groups who are actually working on these initiatives. And even, I know this is not the popular opinion, but you can even join the government bodies that are working on the environment and make the change from within instead of saying out and try to change it. So that's one. And the knowledge, like Gaia said, it's cr absolutely crucial. You know what you're talking about, right? I understand it's humanly impossible to know about everything. So pick your interest area, right? And read learn and follow the new trends. When you have a, strength, a strong knowledge base, it's very easy for you to convince people instead of just grasping ideas from here and there and putting things through. Um, I think you need to know the system to change the system. If you're not sure of what's happening in your country and what the political and the legal system is, it's very difficult you to figure out from where you can make the intervention. So that's one thing. And, um, and this is a country specific, and especially when, because we have international participants, I think you need to figure out where things are going wrong in your country. It could be because of corruption. It could be because of political interventions, right? So when you understand the problem, you can fix the problem. Uh, I have two more, I'll do it quickly. Um, use the existing mechanisms. We can't say there are no mechanisms. Each act that talks about one part of environment says what needs to be done and what can the act or the government do if you're not following with the guideline or the regulation, right? And there are public complaint mechanisms. What people think is, ah, what's the point in complaining when there's not, no one is going to listen to us. But if you can flood the system by keep on complaining, the authorities are bound to take action because I mean, they really can't ignore after a point. So that's fun. And um, there's this right to information uh, procedure that's been in, uh, introduced by the government in 2016, where you are empowered to ask the questions. If you want, you can ask, what are the steps taken by your authority to rectify this situation? How, how well have the air quality been improved in Sri Lanka? Give us statistics from the last five years. Things like that, you, are, you can ask, you are empowered to ask, and the system is supposed to respond to you things like that. And um, before concluding, I have two very interesting trends in the world because we, again, we have a global audience and our youth can actually look into it. One is youth going to court, uh, asking, to, uh, asking the government to uh, safeguard their right to environment, environment of the future generation, right? So there are instances, uh, one case in Netherlands, 
where they they got their government to reduce their carbon emission by 25 percent by going to court right and uh, colombia uh, the government has asked to protect the amazon rainforest to take further steps because young people went to court now this is a trend that we see in pakistan uganda belgium countries like that the final trend we see it's it's not very recent but it's it's being in discussion now recognizing environment as a personhood which means you give a legal identity or a personality for a natural cause example to a river to a mountain to a tree things like that so you give rights and liberties to this natural uh, body so that the government is bound to protect it instead of just being one of the many rivers you have ganges you have the yamuna being recognized as a legal entity so it's not just another river things like that are the recent trends so it's if you really follow the recent trends i think you can really take something out thank you Thank you very much, Netmini Madhavala. While uh, you were answering, I was wondering how you said that. I'm not sure I'll be able to answer in a very interesting way because even if it's law and legislations, you are like answered in a way that all of us uh, really understand that even though we are not in that uh, into law. So thank you very much for the comprehensive answer for the question and uh, clarifying many questions that all of us had. Thank you. And our lovely viewers, I'm sure you would love to speak to uh, all our panelists right now. So the time is for you to ask questions. So we're waiting uh, for you to ask questions from our panelists. I'm sure there are so many questions in you right now where you might be thinking, should I ask or should I not ask? So if you have a question, you need to grab the opportunity and clarify. So do ask us questions. Right now we have one question. Um, that question goes to Natasha. Uh, you have already answered it privately, but I'm sure it will actually uh, support everyone as well. Uh, what kind of changes do you think we should expect in terms of human behavior and consumers? We can unmute it. Uh, I'm okay. I'm okay now. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. So I think the most important thing that we need to do is we need to be uh, conscious human beings. That's the first step uh, for change. Uh, when we are conscious and aware of our surrounding and our environment, uh, you automatically know exactly what to do because you're in line with nature. You, you, you are one with nature. So uh, just like everyone said, I mean, yes, we do the little things. I mean, you know, I, I stopped using uh, plastic uh, seriously bags. Uh, these little things go a long way because if if we continue just because everyone else is doing, I mean, when I go to the supermarket, I see people still so unconscious. I mean, they just, they don't even think about, you know, using a, a recyclable, a recyclable bag, right? But the more you see that you, you just want to go and pick their brains and you want to like say, hey, you know, aren't you conscious about what you're doing? But the thing is, we can't change everyone that, that that change has to come from within. I can't force someone to do it, you know? Like, for example, for the longest time, I was telling my husband to uh, quit smoking and I was literally on his case. But the time, the, the right timing will come. I mean, in situations like this, now this was a perfect timing, right? I mean, he had no choice but to do it. And uh, I think there is another chat, hold on. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I think the first step is uh, being conscious and aware of our surroundings. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you very much for the question. And yes, there are some questions flowing in right now. So um, this question goes to uh, Netmini. 
Uh, so um, the question is from Nirosha Deorukshi. It's in the Q&A box as well. Um, even though many international regulations have been imposed on matters covering the climate change, biodiversity, etc., none of them have succeeded in achieving an environmental recovery to this level so far. So why has it been so? Were there any implementation issues or common weak points in these regulations? If so, what are they? Um, thank you. I think it's Nirosha, right? Nirosha. Yeah, thank you, Nirosha, for the question. I think the main weak point would be the fact that we are focusing on the human, even if we regulate on environment. Uh, it would be on how best the human can benefit by doing something regarding the environment has been the has been in the forefront whenever we talk about the agreements. That's one thing instead of just trying to make the environment better and then as a result humans benefiting, we think the other way. So that is one thing. Second thing would be all these conventions, uh, how a convention happens is that a body di discuss, take an issue, they discuss how best to solve the issue and then they put things in a document and all countries are sovereign, right? So they have their own countries. So what happens is the country is encouraged to go and sign these conventions and when you go and sign these conventions, not all countries would want to do everything, right? And some countries mostly focus on development, like I said. So environment is taking a back seat. So unless um, there's a movement of people uh, pushing their governments to take environment to the forefront and then development, then that's one thing that we can actually focus on as a that is um and i think uh, this is a common criticism um don't agree with me i think you should uh, look up on it is the fact that after, i told you after the world war only these uh, developed countries started talking about the environmental protection and there's a criticism by the developing countries including countries like china that after developed countries achieved a certain standard of development right who emitted the most amount of carbon, who did the most amount of uh, disruption and destruction to the environment. Now these countries, after reaching a certain standard, are telling us, the developing country, to cut down the carbon emission. After doing the bigger damage, you are asking the smaller little countries to uh, come and fall in line. I think this is a common thing for human rights also. Um, but what people fail to see is, yes, it happened. Now, the point is, if we want to have a world that we can live in for the next, I don't know, 100, 200 years, uh, blaming each other and starting the blame game to say, look here, you did it, I'm sorry, we are not going to follow through, it's not going to help. So that's a mentality change that we want. So all these things and little, so there's always in international law, there's this political element, right? Each country makes a decision based on a political push unless you are a saint and which we don't have. We have like two, three countries who are really worried about what the world is going to be. The, all other countries are focusing on how powerful the country can get. So unless we take these personal benefits aside, it's very difficult to achieve what we wanted to achieve 100%. Saying that, I think, but the fact that we have so many agreements makes other international communities push the countries to, achieve, to be, do better as opposed to having none. So I think it's always better to have those uh, safeguards, but we have to work on them also. Thank you very much, uh, Nitni, and thank you, Nirosha Dirukshi, for the question. And uh, now we have another question. It's actually open up to all the panelists. Uh, how Sri Lanka should implement recycling policies and plans? And this question is from Kali Rikbal. how Sri Lanka should implement recycling policies and plans. Any panelists who would like to answer the question? Um, I would like to like maybe add to it, uh, but I invite all the other panelists to extend this uh, opening. So what I think is, um, let's say brand endorsements, companies, corporations who are main responsible in producing plastics in the first place should really 
financially or non-financially contribute into you know bringing it back into the circulation and trying to compensate for it so i think the main companies who are responsible in um, producing the most amount of waste should really partner up with the government or you know semi government agencies to you know activate certain policies on recycling them on maybe uh, on a practical level and also i think um, this is an opportunity for us to also really engage on it by um, kind of supporting policies by really demanding a lifestyle that does not require plastics so if from our end also we do have responsibility of rejecting that so the demand goes down so the production reduces so we also have a responsibility of uh, creating a domino effect backwards to on corporation level as well so um i don't know extensively on the policy side but i do believe that uh, brands and corporations who are responsible in creating products and services that consumes a lot of uh, waste should definitely come on board with the government and create a compensation process thank you very much hiroshi and thank you very much for the question uh, khalid iqbal and there are so many questions uh, coming in flowing in uh, okay let me uh, pick one more adding to uh, adding to what uh, hiroshi said i think we all need to kind of uh, uh, press on with banning plastics i wasn't there something in the loop back in the day that they were going to ban plastics and then no one's talking about it because i think we there's a lot of corruption involved in our country so because of that reason i think there's a lot of you know it it just falls through the cracks if you know what i mean so i think we all need to press on and kind of like uh talk talk to the government authorities or like as a collective uh, our voices are can be heard uh but the thing is we we need to do that because plastic was never meant to be on this earth thank you very much natasha thank you and thank you hiroshi anyone else would like to add in something and actually uh when you said that natasha what came to my mind is that um uh, uh me like innovating is something really really amazing and great and people should be inspired to innovate but uh something that i always tell uh, many people is that uh, when you actually innovate uh remember that you innovate something useful for the country and think twice before you innovate because plastic was also innovated and then later on all these things are being actually used so uh, whenever you come up with something an idea Uh, ask yourself uh, is it going to help people uh, what is it going to uh, do or how you can actually make sure that you prevent uh, you know causing a lot of damage because what i see is uh, uh, more than the time we take to innovate and promote and do certain things i think we uh, as a country as a world has wasted so much of time to find solutions to uh, figure out how to come out of it but i think the the bottom line is we need to go back to our basics back in the day there wasn't plastics and our parents went to you know to their supermarkets or i mean their their vendors carrying cloth bags or just uh, hung mallas you know what i'm saying so i think we need to go back to our basics that like i said in my little uh, you know a few words um mm -hmm. we need to do that because as a as a as a country if we don't do that uh, i don't know where we are going to head and i personally feel like if we can't an intellectually approach uh to people to make this change uh, one other um i guess the sme sector could do a wonderful job by creating creating cool trends i mean now sustainable living has become a trend like it's the cool thing to do now wearing like hand looms wearing eco friendly outfits so if we can't really with the facts and figures if we can't really get into the consciousness of people maybe the youth can get together with the sme sector the youngsters the startup companies to create a hip cool lifestyle that people welcome into their lives simply because they love to be entertained by by that so maybe we can creatively kind of go around it and and make this change happen by kind of putting it under the disguise of something that people are actually people actually enjoy doing
So I guess that's one way we can approach maybe the millennials, the Gen Zs. Um, but when it comes to the older generation who recently evolved into this plastic culture, uh, there's a, a little bit of stubbornness that we need to kind of negotiate ourselves into. Uh, but I think it's still possible. The problem is, I think, not with us. It's the companies that produce plastic. Because I remember back in the day, um, uh, in the interim, interim of uh, switching jobs, my husband actually worked for a plastic company and they, they brought in pallets and they were literally selling pallets to, you know, uh, for these uh, consuming, I mean, produce these bags and various items, right? But uh, the problem with that is uh, we need to kind of push forward in changing their mind, you know, that they need to be conscious of what they're doing. That's, that's, that, that's the problem. It's not you and I, because you and I are already, we, we already know what we need to know, right? And we know the damage is doing to our planet. But I think we need to kind of like, uh, to ask the governments to put a ban on these plastics or, you know, put, I don't know, high, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, uh, cost that that will be involved in bringing down plastics. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Hiroshi, for the answers as well. Um, surely, um, as Hiroshi also mentioned, uh, creativity, I believe that uh, here we have Natasha, then Gayatri, Hiroshi, Netmini, uh, all four of you here. Uh, surely we can create a trend because I believe that um, I believe that when you voice and like when one person whispers, it's just a whisper, right? But when so many people start whispering, it becomes a huge noise. And I'm sure all these viewers are watching us today because they really feel for the environment. I'm sure they're not just investing time for the sake of watching something. They're watching for a reason because they would love to make an impact. So I believe that every single person will be the change that you always wanted to see. Because I think it's high time that we all voice and it's high time that we all whisper together as one family because we are all sharing the earth together. And that itself proves that all of us are family. So, uh, so creative people start working on it and I believe that you'll definitely make an impact. So once again, thanks, uh, Natasha and Hiroshi for the answers as well. And thank you very much for the brilliant. Uh, uh, there is a question uh, by Hashini and Hashini Sirivardhana uh, for me and Gaia uh, on meditation and spirituality. Uh, for beginner, how to start it? Any guidelines? This uh, is meditation, is it? I think you, should, you, sh you answer it and then I'll, 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 let, I'll contribute to it. Okay, so um, meditation. Um, let's let's start. Let's start with something really simple. This is where I started um, in regards to meditation. Um, so a common um, misconception we have about meditation is that it's an attempt to stop thoughts, and that it's not humanly possible because you know it's our mind's job to be thinking. So we, we start with non-judgment. Yeah. So um, what I invite you to do is have a reference point. There are different types of meditation. There's transcendental meditation where you chant certain mantras inwardly. Um, but what I personally do is I focus on my breath. So uh, it's called diaphragmatic breathing. So that's when you breathe into your stomach. So when you watch a little infant breathe or when you see infants, uh, infant sleep, when they breathe, their tummy moves, not the chest. So most of us are uh, shallow breathers because of anxiety and stress and all of that. So when you get into meditation, you first start with your breath. So you get into, you relax, you focus on the breath. So what I personally do is I focus on the breath moving into my stomach and then it leaving my body and, you know, the, the process continues. So while the breath is my reference point, every few seconds, <laughs> my, my thoughts wander. And I would talk, think about the most bizarre, random things. But when this happens, your job is not to think, oh, that shouldn't have happened. That, that was not a smooth meditation flow. It's not, your job is not to judge. Your job is to bring, uh, bring yourself back to your reference point, which is your breath. And you keep doing this. So when you do this over time, uh, the gap 
of no thought um, gets bigger. So you have longer periods of, uh, uh, you know, time where you're not thinking, where you're actually connected with your breath. And it'll, um, it'll get longer and longer and longer with practice. And once uh, this level of meditation is practiced, maybe then you can go into other types of meditation like Vipassana, like deeper levels of meditation. But this, I feel like, takes time. I mean, it sounds simple, but it takes time to master. Um, and the more practice you do, I mean, trust me, even your reactions towards life, uh, towards your partner, towards your mother, they say, you know, if you're enlightened, go spend time with your family. <laughs> so like that, nothing will trigger you. Even if it triggers you, you will know how to disconnect from it really fast because you know it's the nature of the mind to assume, to um, um, either think about the past or focus on the future and never be, sorry, and never be present. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, um, you know, that's something you can try. Anyone can try. Uh, adding to what uh, Gaia said, I think when you deep breathe, exhale and inhale, it's just a matter of relaxing. You have to, you have to find that relaxation. Mm -hmm. The reason you breathe uh, inwardly and outwardly is because you, you have to find that place of relaxation. And when you find that re relaxation, then you just observe your thoughts. You just close your eyes and observe your thoughts. I am going to give you a few um, names which you can maybe Google, maybe uh, you know uh, YouTube them. Uh, they are pretty much all over. Uh, Kelly Howell is one of. Um, uh, I'll, I'll maybe put it on the. Maybe I'll, I'll type it or maybe put it on the uh, question and answer so people can actually see the names. And Dr. Uh, Joe Dispenza. Uh, mm. This was yeah. someone who I. I was totally inspired by because I was going through a lot of, um, you know, uh, hormonal imbalances, and I tried the Western practice. I mean, the the conventional methods of healing, and it didn't work. Uh, even though uh, I tried it several times, uh, for example, like seven, eight times, uh, seven, eight doctors actually. Uh, but uh, ultimately, I had to. I had to literally tell myself that I can heal my body through my mind, uh, uh, through natural ways of healing. I've healed many, many things in my body. For example, I was born with a hernia. Uh, I literally lived pretty much half of my life with a hernia. And uh, I, it was a really pretty big hernia. And I healed my hernia through my mind. Uh, you know, I don't, don't even ask how, but that's the power of your mind, right? And meditations, when you go into deep meditation, med meditations, you actually can uh, access that capacity within you. And when I say, uh, you know, you can just listen to some uh, music and just go inwardly, like close your eyes and then start observing your thoughts and start uh, initially, like I didn't know how to meditate, right? I, I I thought it was such a complicated thing, but it's not a complicated thing. I mean, the more you do it, the, 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 you enjoy it. You start enjoying that moment, right? And uh, what I tell people is uh, when you close your eyes and meditate and you, you ex inhale and exhale, uh, you need to uh, first start thanking the universe for your body, literally every, every part of your body, you know, connect with, uh, connect with source. You can, you, I mean, you can call it God, you can call it nature, you can call intelligent mind, whatever you want to call it, right? But you connect with source and you start thanking the universe for every part of your body. And then you go into uh, uh, thanking the people who, uh, this is all in thought, obviously, thanking the people who uh, have uh, invested in you, all the good that, that has come out of you, the people who have invested their time energy and uh, you know all the good that have happened to you the third one is the most difficult because um, it's not easy to forgive people i mean now looking looking back it uh, it because we when we hold on to negative attributes like a, a negative uh, what do you call it emotions like for example if someone hates me uh, and i hate them back uh, i'm only hating myself you get what i'm saying so mm -hmm. the minute you start releasing these negative attributes, for example, if someone has done you wrong, the third aspect is just to send them healing, send them love in your mind, because they are all energetically 
uh, connected. When I say energetically connected, we, um, for example, I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you a perfect example, right? When you think about someone and they immediately start, they call you or they text you, and then you wonder, what the heck? I mean, how did, I mean, they, they called me. And it used to happen to me all the time back in the day, I didn't even know what it was. And now I understand because when I say we're energetically connected, because there's a realm that you can't see through, uh, with your physical eyes, you can't see it. But the minute you think about someone, if you're, if you're sending negative uh, thoughts to them, they, they affect, they, it, it affects them. Trust me. So, uh, but the problem is when it affects them, it affects you also. So your thoughts have to be pure. Your thoughts have to be clean. And uh, we carry on so much of negative aspects. It, it turns into energies. Uh, these, these negative uh, uh, energies are trapped in our bodies, which, which eventually turn into sicknesses. Uh, you know, I mean, I can go on about it, but uh, we, we have very limited time. I think Gaia knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so in that meditation, the third as aspect of it is uh, send love and healing and forgiveness is something that we all have to do. We have to, in our meditations, to send healing and forgiveness to all the people who have hurted us, you know. And when we do that, you have no idea how uh, light you feel. It's like all these years you've been carrying so much of weight. And then when you do that, uh, it's like energetically all the blockages. We have like seven energy centers. They all they all uh, align, they all connect, you know? And so when you do these little, little things, uh, it, it changes your uh, energy because we all have an aura around us. And sometimes uh, like, for example, I mean, I'm say I'm in a room and someone walks into a room and they, whatever, they, they talk to me and they leave. And then suddenly the, the air yeah, is so dense and so negative. Like you feel, oh my God, what the hell is that? But that is their energy. You know, when you come into a room, you bring your energy with you. So I feel that we all have a, a different vibration. And when you, in your meditations, you, uh, the third aspect is a very, very important. If you want to heal your body, if you want to uh, reach different levels of, uh, you know, spiritual enlightenment, this is an important aspect of uh, what you need to do. And the third, uh, the fourth one, I would recommend you to visualize, you know, visualize and have, we all have little short term and long term goals. And it doesn't necessarily have to be achievements. Like, for example, some people uh, don't have uh, money and they want to manifest uh, some money, which, which uh, you know, will pay a bill or something like that. And these things can be done through your mind. So you just visualize the outcome of what you want to have. For example, if you want to manifest 10,000 bucks, right? And these are little, this is just mine, just one example, right? I mean, the, the, the spectrum is so large. Uh, and for example, if you want to manifest money, you just visualize. Uh, and I'll give you a little trick. Um, these manifestations happen when, it's a, when, when your thoughts are, um, serve a greater good, not just you. Like, when you're um, when you're visualizing something for a personal and selfish motive that that delays I feel but when it's when it when it uh, serves a greater good just not just me but you know people uh, and it it manifests really fast and I have been a recipient of that for pretty much all my life and I, I had uh, believe it or not uh, this without my knowledge I have been doing it since I was a kid like, for example, everyone asked me, how did you come into the uh, music industry, right? So back in the day, um, well, I was born with, uh, uh, what do you call uh, not, not iPods, but it was Walkmans back in the day. So I used, to, I, I used to put Walkmans on and I used to visualize myself singing like Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, and uh, I used to literally visualize these things. And, and I never really thought that I would become a singer, but, you know, uh, look where I am. You know what I'm saying? So your, your thoughts, you, you have to learn to dream. You have to learn to dream big, but when it, when it serves a greater good, it manifests really fast. And so I would say that the fourth thing to do is have little small-term and long-term goals, which you can achieve. And yes, you have to work hard. 
and we all of us know uh, you know hard work never goes to waste uh, and uh, but i would give you some um, some meditation um, uh, uh, names i mean for example uh, ekhart tolle he has books and he has uh, and um, uh, kelly howell um, dr joe jo dispenser <laughs> Also, Abraham Mix is pretty amazing. And I want to add one small thing before we move on to what Natasha said about forgiveness. So um, I went through sexual abuse when I was 22 years old. And um, I realized, although I thought I processed it, um, um, when I went for this meditation retreat is when I really understood, oh, wow, like this was, I know during that moment, it was really tough for me being raped as at, at the age of 22. It's not easy. It was probably the darkest moment in my life back then. But um, during that retreat, I realized that was the best thing that happened to me because that really snowballed into something else. I was pushed into a lot of pain. And because I was pushed into a lot of pain, I had, I was, I had, uh, I had to force myself to come out of it, which paved the path to movement, to lifting weights, to training, to competing, meditating. And it was the greatest gift. So I, I think a lot of us don't understand that our trauma, um, our mess can be our message. So you need, to, you need to shift your perspective and see it differently. Because these things are considered woo-woo stuff, you know, in yeah. the in the in the uh, realm that we live in, we yeah. it's considered a woo-woo stuff. But the thing is, you have no idea how powerful it is. I mean, uh, and I was I shared this information with a friend who has, like Gaia just mentioned, she had been sexually abused by her uncle, and uh, she was she she has been carrying this weight for so long and uh, she she has put on weight and she was depressed and uh, having all kinds of um, complications in, in terms of uh, um, what do you call it um, Ill illnesses like diseases and the minute I shared this with her I told her do this and I kid you not I'm not even making this up but she said she did it it was the hardest thing to do to forgive someone who has literally raped you uh, the minute she forgave and she sent love to this this person, uh, energetically, everything changed for her. And uh, she said that the person actually got she he fell from a ladder or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, I said, please don't be happy that he fell from a ladder because uh, that's not for you to uh, you know uh, be happy about. But mm -hmm. when we when we let go of uh, you know when we let go of uh, these uh, energies, for example, I mean, if somebody has done something wrong, I, because of my pride, I hold on to it because I think oh, I'm going to teach you a lesson. So I'm going to hold on to it. But the thing is, I'm the one who suffers that, 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 that uh, sickness comes upon me, actually. So the more we realize uh, there is uh, the, the power of these things, you know, as a collective, we need to kind of do these for ourselves. Because that's why uh, the epigenesis and uh, the quantum field is real. It's the God field or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, what you send is what you receive. Mm -hmm. So you want to say something? Me? Yeah. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm just saying that uh, we all need to kind of do our little experiment and just, just try it out. I'm not even saying do your own research, actually, because... Uh, I tried the conventional methods of healing, which, which unfortunately was a disappointment. I'm not saying that it will be a disappointment for, a disappointment for everyone else, but it, it was a, disappointed, a disappointment for me. And uh, I didn't know where to look. Uh, I had to go inwardly. So I had healed myself of arthritis, which, uh, which I was told that my hormonal imbalance was uh, not curable, but it was only manageable. I had I had PCOD for a long, for the longest time, and uh, I couldn't do anything. Like I had I had I was lethargic. I was having my menses for like uh, seven eight months continuously. And uh, whoever it's, is watching this, right? It's really amazing to um, hear. Like I mean, like especially the personal stories coming from the heart of Natasha Gayatri and everyone. It's amazing. So like really 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 i'm sure like uh, all the viewers like 
uh, like wanting to listen to you more and more and gather like more information which will definitely help us to uh, grow as individuals and especially to help us grow to discover the true uh, person within us so I, I i feel so bad to stop here because the time is ticking yeah. and uh, i myself would love to listen to everything maybe offline we can take it and i can ask more questions about it for sure and um, maybe on another day the others can also we can have another q and a session that everyone can learn so much from all of you so uh, maybe final question because we have only um, uh, say 10 minutes left uh, i'll have to uh, throw a question to hiroshi and so once again thank you natasha and gayatri and uh, so the final question to hiroshi would be uh, the ayurvedic techniques were prominently being used these days for treatment purposes as the western medicine failed in finding a cure for coronavirus so does this point show that ayurvedic medicine has received more importance when compared to western medicine in the global context and can we guarantee that the people's reliance on ayurvedic medicine have a positive impact between the connection of people and nature Yes, I think uh, definitely building an adequate relationship with nature is very important for healing at any level. That's for sure. Uh, in terms of the COVID nineteen situation, um, it's still a novel experience for the medical practitioners as to how the treatment process should be conducted, given that everyone's genetic composition, the, the combination of who they are, is, is unique. So at this point, uh, we are not sure whether a certain type of treatment can guarantee. a cure for each and every person equally sometimes it could work on someone who has a different genetic makeup someone who has better tolerance someone who has better a detoxing system someone who has better immunity so depending on the you know the scientific uniqueness of a person maybe ayurvedic treatment or western medicine could work differently but however at this point we have seen that uh, ayurvedic medical treatments are kind of ahead in the game when it comes to giving at least alleviating symptoms in the situation um but i do believe that uh, there is definitely a global acceptance for natural medicine um in fact in the pharmaceutical industry not a lot of drugs get fda approved anymore because of its toxicity and there's a massive opportunity there's an opportunity space for plant based medicine to come into play which we are all rooting for coming from a tropical island with the ayurvedic um, inheritance and indigenous medicine of course so we we are rooting for it and we hope even in the context of corona it could come into a commercial take off um but at the moment uh, despite all the successes that we are experiencing i do advice i want to advise everyone to make sure that these treatments are recommended by medical professionals and to make sure that if you are um spreading the information on you know how eligible it is or how you know good it is or conductive it is make sure that uh, you get access to right information because right now even on social media platforms i've seen enough and more information about ayurvedic medicine working we want to support it and push it through but under the right guidance and the right policy so if if it is true then good for us um and i do believe the more natural it is the, the less synthetic a treatment is the better it is on your body because we are not uh, redesigning or modifying the blueprint of who we are we are not exploiting our body on anything else so the more natural it is it's definitely better so i do hope that on a global platform ayurvedic and natural plant based medicine will have a a major role to play uh, but for the time being uh, whatever that uh, whatever the recovery um, treatments that are out there make sure that they are approved by the right agencies and uh, the medical the um, the gmoa certain other boards are definitely in the process of uh, you know monitoring these uh, drugs so make sure that it is it has got clearance and it is um provided by verified sources that are suitable for use in the future with that definitely we are hoping that ayurvedic will do ayurvedic medicine will do a take off yeah thank you very much hiroshi we have one more question and we have only very few minutes left so this question is for nitmini uh as like india doesn't have any constitution related to environment if i'm not wrong usa doesn't have any constitution where the president have the authority to use curfew to stop people going from one state to another state so as we have constitutional issues in terms of curfew implication and environment specifically 
especially uh, what's your idea on it the question is uh, from an anonymous attendee hi anonymous um that's a very tough question to answer um india doesn't have explicit provisions but then the question is about how usa is trying to manage curfew is it um uh, mm-hmm. i am really sorry if possible um send the question in a very because i'm not clear as to how i need to answer this is it about the curfew in america or how the constitution issue in because imposing curfew in sri lanka is uh, it's debatable i might get uh, crucified for saying this but um when you impose a curfew you have to guess at it um you can't issue a curfew by sending letters um, by different bodies it has to go in a gazette so in that sense constitutionally yes it's problematic because i haven't seen a gazette at least i haven't um but it's a all together different um uh question and extremely political so i would like to refrain from answering it but if it's something to do with the environment yeah sure i'll answer thanks a lot nethmini so uh, the person the anonymous uh, person who came up with the question you can surely direct the question related to the organizing committee so surely uh, we can support you uh, with that with whatever the information that uh, we can provide so um, i'm sure there are many other because i had to stop natasha gayatri and the other panelists really really fast because we are running out of time so uh, but i'm sure um, including myself who have a lot of questions to ask them so i'm sure you have a lot of questions so make sure that you uh, drop a message to the organizing committee that you can get your questions clarified as well so uh, maybe or maybe ask them to send the questions uh, on uh, in instagram uh, as a private message so we can actually uh, uh, answer it more uh, more accurately so you can definitely uh, maybe speak them through facebook or instagram you have natasha ratnayak then gayatri kolito aku netmini madhavala Hiru, she just said you can surely uh, send questions to them, and if they have the time, and if it's uh, like uh, if uh, I'm sure that with time they will definitely answer your questions. Um, so there are so many questions come flowing in. Uh, we have to actually. Uh, uh, I'm just closing the Q and A box, which is like popping, popping, popping. Do we so, need to uh, stick? Do we need to stick to the time though? If uh, if they want. Uh, Uh, do we have to stick to the time because we can make some uh, you know adjustments uh, and the organizing committee saying like yes 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 <laughs> <laughs> so um thanks a lot once again i was i'm really um, actually excited in as i mean the panelists as well so finally uh, maybe you can give one message uh, maybe by taking maybe few seconds um yeah so maybe i'll start with uh, netmini Uh, what is the message you would like to give uh, to our viewers a very very short message that all of you can actually share okay i'm going to read it out because i'm going to miss out otherwise um mm-hmm. <laughs> it's only by questioning a system that we can help fix it and by doing so no step is too small or you are not too small to take a step and uh, if we have a vigilant population the government will have to deliver um regardless of whether we like they like to do it or not and uh, learn something new every day on environment so you are well well versed with what's happening when you have to make an intervention that's what i want thank you very very much netmini um gayatri um unmute it please um <laughs> <laughs> uh, Can yeah. you? Can you? Okay. We can do it. Right. Um, so one thing I noticed during this time of quarantine is the fact that a lot of people are just frustrated. I feel like a lot of people are frustrated because they've never spent time alone. They've never spent time um, engaged in their own company. So um, make this an opportunity. Take this as an opportunity to evolve as a human being. Uh, look into your pain. Ask yourself as to why you are uncomfortable being alone, and uh, just do a lot of introspection, self uh, reflection, and, and meditation because that alone will change you and transform you as a person. And that alone will help you um, treat the environment, treat the planet, and treat your neighbor better. Thank you very much, uh, Gayatri. And then we're moving on to Hiroshi. 
Yes. Um, I would actually like to start from uh, an ideology given forward by Dalai Lama. Actually, uh, once this quarantine period is over, you're out in the world trying to normalize again. And you have two choices, either to keep making the mistakes you did make before this whole situation came on board, or you learn to revive and live a new life that is healthy and in harmony with the bigger forces in the universe. Um, always remember that your thoughts are what leads you translates to your actions and your words and your actions and your words will collectively create your behavior your behaviors will create your personality your personality will give you the experiences and decide your destiny so this all starts with the quality of your thoughts so make sure you are empowered for the right reasons and make sure you maintain the quality of your thoughts always and from that if you can change the blueprint of who you are you can definitely reflect on great levels to to the outside and that will always give nothing but the best in return uh, that's really great. Thank you very much, uh, Hiroshi. And uh, actually, there's this one question popping out all the time, like about uh, especially talking about um, women empowerment and how your deal uh, in the industries, uh, in wherever, whatever profession uh, you're into. Uh, maybe uh, actually, uh, if you are the person who really wanted to know that, you can surely drop in a message to all the panelists, and I'm sure they will be happy to answer you. Uh, that for sure, because I'm sure it's not going to be a short answer because uh, there'll be many stories behind that and there are so many things to share with you. <laughs> so maybe you can surely drop a message and they'll be happy to answer you. So finally, Natasha, what would you love to tell our lovely viewers? Uh, what I'd like to say is that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And I think uh, we need to uh, elevate towards consciousness to be aware of our uh, uh, our actions, how it affects each other, how it affects the environment, how it affects, you know, our decision making. And when we are that, I think we truly can be the change that we want to see in this world. So um, I, I also want to say that uh, please uh, do keep your immune system up. So your know, happy thoughts, uh, immunity is key for everything you know fear-based environments create sicknesses so i think you know uh, when you when you can have uh, your immune system uh, strong nothing can harm you so that that also taking from where uh, uh, gaia said i mean meditation is key uh, go inwardly so anyway thank you for having me uh, love this uh, chat. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha, and a very big thank you to all the panelists, Natasha Ratnayaka, Gayatri Koditwaku, known as Gaya, and then Netmini Madhavala and Hiroshi Jayasena. Thank you so much for your uh, details and uh, especially uh, the experience that you actually shared with us. And uh, one thing that I would like to remind is uh, that you have definitely uh, made, made an impact already. And I'm sure you will We'll keep hiring people. I'm sure you all will keep motivating others and will do something amazing. So I wish you all the very best, Natasha, Gayatri, Netmini. He loved talking to you all. And uh, I'm sure everyone loved you all as well. So a very big thank you to you all once again. And um, everyone, Expertify 2020 is organized by the Expertify 2020 Organizing Committee, Isaac in University of Sri Javadampura, and the technical partner TIIKM, Inside Partner World Conference on Children and Youth, and magazine partner Chocolate Magazine. And apparently, Chocolate Magazine is planning to publish an article about this as well. So we are excited to see that as well. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, and all you viewers. As I told before, I'm sure you'll make an impact for sure. So let me remind you the quote that I started with. Your body might be in quarantine right now, but remember that your mind has the power to travel anywhere you want. In the and so innovate, inspire, love unconditionally and smile and don't forget to meditate and respect each other. And most importantly, discover your true self. And it's a trying time for all of us, whatever your nationality is. I wanted to touch upon this because 
more than uh, 20 participants from uh, 20 countries participating today for this international webinar series. So it's a trying time for all of us. So whatever your nationality is, religion, or your position is, it doesn't matter. We are all in this together. We are all sharing the same earth, which means we are family. So I'm happy to talk to them. Let's make this trying time a learning to let go of your ego, attitude, selfishness, jealousy, ignorance, and let's make sure that we'll make this opportunity, we'll make this an opportunity to love each other, respect, appreciate others, and discover our true capabilities, abilities, wants, and most importantly, as I mentioned before, and as all the panelists mentioned before, that to discover the true self, especially discover why you were born to this world, the purpose of your birth. And it's easy to say it in words, but it's not easy when it comes to practicing as uh, the panelists also mentioned. So a lot of uh, patience and uh, I'm sure that all of us together by, uh, you know, using everything that the panelists said with all knowledge and the experience you have, we can conquer this together. So let's conquer this together. Thank you very much. And let's be the change we always want to see. A very big thank everyone. Please stay at home and stay safe.